Continuing on to our study here in regards to bokeh and uh, depth of field as we approach our PG bokeh tutorial, I wanted to just shoot some footage. Um, in this case, I was using spherical base lenses uh, with my Blackmagic Pocket 4K uh, using a couple of lenses that I've put together. Uh, one is a Pentex to Micro Four Thirds uh, to a Pentex 50 millimeter, which with the crop factor was about 100 millimeter with uh, the uh, basic field of view. But you can see the it, this is an old lens, uh, Japanese lens. So it's like 2, 2.8, 4, and it's click. So it's like clicking. It's not smooth or anything like that. But you're going to see a difference as I kind of go through some of this footage, uh, what, th what they look like. So I wanted to show what the lens looks like as I stop it down. And the character of what the bokeh will be, uh, will look like, will be based on the actual, actually, blades here. So you can see when the aperture is fully open, I mean, it's practically a perfect sphere. So you'll see this in the footage. And as we stop down to, in this case, like probably 2.8 or 2, uh, or sorry, 2.8, you'll see that it starts to take on the, the blades, but it also has sort of like, uh, it's, it's not a perfectly flat blade. There's like these little lips right here, you can see. So as we kind of like just pull this through, you'll start to see the, the little lip here. And this is all the characteristics of old style lenses. Um, the imperfections are what most cinematographers are trying to go for right now, is these old 80s lenses and so forth. This is an old Japanese lens. Um, you can see how I start to stop down. Again, we have one, two, three, four, five, six sides. Um, and that's pretty much it. So let's like, take a look at some footage. So here is just a headlight uh, where I live, and you can see that fully open uh, F uh, aperture here. It's a kind of spherical, and we go to 2.8. We get, obviously, uh, six sides here. And we also get this sort of uh, glint, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of flare glint that kind of comes off of it. Again, this is not something that was made artificially. This is actually how the lens is c capturing the image. And we close it up even more, and we get like these little glints and so forth that come off. So again, it's a good study because, again, depending on the intensity, if you have a series of bokeh circles around here, um, if the light isn't very intense, you're not going to get this interesting flaring. So there it could be, there are many ways to sort of emulate this sort of glint based on luminance data value that they get these sort of star uh, sort of artifacts only on areas that are very bright, which I'm going to demonstrate here in a second. So here's the same lens. Again, we have a car headlight right here, which is very bright, and another headlight or a street light here. But you can see how these lights, besides we, we're getting some flaring, obviously, um, but you can see the little glints and so forth and the glows that are coming off these lights and how bright they are and so forth. So we can kind of like, here as I take the f-stop down, the characteristics of what these uh, bokeh circles look like play a big part based on what the f-stop is. So again, this is something that as being, uh, you know, someone that's uh, logging the camera information on set, they can also, I mean, you're going to just obviously mimic this and try to create this inside the computer as your sort of default filter shape. Uh, but also just seeing how the shapes look at different f-stops and so forth. You'll see it in the footage because obviously if you're trying to match an out-of-focus spaceship going by in the background here with this much out-of-focus blur, um, again, you're going to have to create these artifacts, right? And if the actual, say, spaceship flies by and has a very bright light, you're going to have to actually recreate this sort of artifact of flaring um, in the camera. So it's always good to have reference, obviously. The other artifact I wanted to bring about was the fact that, you know, as you continue to flare something or uh, take it out of focus, the brightness actually diminishes. So you can see here, as I kind of like completely go crazy out of focus here we get little tiny artifacts here and then the general transparency of this sort of becomes kind of dulled out or the intensity or value so you can see kind of like that's what it looks like there it almost got almost looks like it has spots the other reality is that if you get like a tree uh like some sort of tree or twig kind of moving in the wind when you get to this amount of uh defocus it'll start to flicker a little bit. And a lot of the mechanics of Nuke are actually, you know, and just your the filtering tools you'll be using will do that for you, but usually this will flicker altogether if like a tree limb is in front of the light and it's waving up and down. So here is an example of taking your original filtered image 
and adding a glint. Um, so you can see it, what I do is I start with a constant. This is from last lesson. I build a flare with six sides. Uh, I use the reformat node so I can change up the resolution. And then I add a glint, which if we kind of take a look at the options here. I just have six sides. You can change the length. You can change the rotation, but obviously you want to keep it the same. And then from color, you can change that up a little bit. And then what I do is I shuffle this uh, into the alpha channel. Because remember, when you're dealing with plugging a filter, you want to look at your alpha, and that's going to be the black and white information that drives the shape of your bokeh and your ZD focus or your convolve node. So now I can go ahead and take a look through here, and you can see I have these little shapes. Now this is not the best way to do this. Um, as you as you obviously can see here, I can turn the glint off, and the shape obviously gets pretty dramatic there. Um, but it is what it is. Again, there's you, these things can be done separately through masks and so forth, and it's not the most ideal way of doing it because they're all universally the same brightness. Uh, but then you can also come over here to the luminance value here uh, from the luminance key and start to pull back uh, how much actually we you know what gets you know, basically on a normalized range here, gets the most light information to g actually get a flare. So if you just want specifically the brightest parts of the image, in this case, if we take a look at this, this is the only things that we're going to get, and you can paint out these areas if you don't want them, uh, that are actually going to physically get a glare. So you can see like that. And again, you can combine this sort of stuff with setting up another one of these glints uh, based on the luminance values that are a little bit lower. So, for instance, if we wanted to choose the the you know the lightest images here. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. See if I can. I haven't done this thing in a while. <laughs> so probably like the you could do the inverse of this, or I'm probably doing this wrong. Um, but you get it. Um, you basically can get the 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 the, the darkest uh, areas of light to actually be what you want to drive the actual CD focus. So again, uh, again, this is not the most robust way of doing this. I'm just showing you examples of things to keep in mind that the shape of your bokeh can come in all types of weird half circle shapes and half transparent with like transparent centers. So there's a lot of time that's taken into matching the camera you shot on, the lens that it was shot through and matching the actual shot itself. And that is a whole art unto itself, along with lens flares, creating artifacts that the camera picks up uh, that are imperfections is a good portion of working in compositing.